All right, excellent. Well, I'm here to talk about how you as marketers can have more influence, bigger budgets, more impact, and a rocking career. And some people may now think, is he out of his mind? Has he actually read any newspapers recently? Marketing budgets get cut, marketers get laid off, and we're sitting in this wonderful Cubex hall with a mask. <laughs> How cool is that? That's the time in marketing we're facing. And now I'm here to tell you that this is marketing's moment. The thing that every CEO that I've ever met in the last couple of months is looking for is growth. Trying to find a way out of the slump, getting back to growth. And this is the room full of the most talented people of the country whose speciality is growth. This has to be marketing's moment, and I believe this has to be your moment. This has to be your moment if you're ready to be a change leader. Great marketers are great change leaders. But I've got to be honest with you, this is going to be really difficult. This is difficult because you as marketers, you have gaps that other people do not have. The first gap is the skills gap. How many of you, let's raise hands, how many of you would say, I fully understand digital marketing? Raise of hands. Oh, okay, one person. I tell you what, a lot of people are going to a digital marketing conference and they're coming home and they're looking into a mirror and they pull this baby face saying, oh my God, you know, I, don't, I know nothing. The problem is there's so much new stuff, impossible to catch up, no chance, no matter how good you are. So in marketing, you will always have to live with that skills gap. The problem is with the skills gap, it takes the confidence away, but it shouldn't. You just got to accept it. But that's not, more, that's not half of it. There's also a trust gap. How much of your work that you're doing this week is about the future? Future revenue, future customers, future profit. I mean, how much is, is it like? Now, for most people I meet, it's like 70, 80, 90 percent. What do you say to someone who tells you, I know the future? You tell them, oh, no, you don't. That's why when you stand on the marketer stand next to someone from finance, Everything the marketer says will sound less reliable because it is. You can't change it. You will always have to live with the trust gap. And that's what, if you ask a lot of CEOs, what they think when they hear the marketing department, right? The VP of cool stuff, the budget burner, the head of fancy campaigns, FAP of dreams, and la 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 agency. In some companies, the repetition isn't great. Then we have to change it. But there is even more, there's a power gap. Just imagine your company had this wonderful customer experience. Everybody loves your company. Everybody does. Customers are raving, you know, or your agency. How many people will have to be involved to make it happen? Well, almost everybody. And how many of these people report to you or to your clients or to the people that you talk to? Very few. Right? Marketers are always facing a massive power gap. The problem is, we don't really talk about this, because when you're starting out in marketing or you're starting out in an agency and you want to make it big, you're getting 200 emails a day and everybody tells you Steve Jobs was a great marketer, you know, and then you work really hard and you hope one day I have this fantastic campaign, that fantastic launch, that fantastic sale, and when I have it, I'll become really successful, I become influential. And then you're telling your proposal and people don't like it and your boss doesn't like it and you cut your budget and you're hitting this wall. And you're saying, damn it, you know. And you tell yourself, well, I got to work harder to become more influential. One day I will become more influential. Well, let me tell you, it's not true. It's exactly the other way around. In marketing, you must learn to become influential so all the hard work you do actually pays off. Now, everybody can do a chart like this. Very easy, right? Took me two minutes. Let me prove it to you. Let me prove to you what we want to say. Patrick Barbeis, London Business School professor, and I, we did the largest ever study on the success of marketers, 1,232 leaders, 80 countries, 68,000 assessments, big. 
to figure out what actually matters for the success of a marketer. But this is the book we wrote, The 12 Parts of a Marketing Leader. It has all the tips, and don't take my word, but take Seth Godin, Jim Stengel, or Sin Seller. But what drives business impact of markets? What is it? Is it the industry, B2B versus B2C? No, it's not under 1%, very small bubble here. That means it doesn't matter in which industry you work. It's not a success criteria. How about gender? We have, I'm very glad to see, we have a lot of females in the room, which is fantastic, and I wish so many more industries had this. Does it play a role in marketing, whether you're male or female, for success? No, it doesn't. That's good news. When it comes to screwing up in marketing, total equality. <laughs> Same thing. How about personality, how you're wired? Very small. It's not about your personality. The bad news is you can't blame your parents. Right? It's not your genes, unfortunately. You have to, success in marketing is on you. How about technical skills? All the stuff we talk about, you know, in the blogs and, you know, the whole, like, books, everything, right? 15%, roughly. Does that mean they don't matter? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that everybody has them. It's not special to have marketing. Of course, you need, you need to have marketing skills. You need to train them. Yesterday night, we talked a lot about, you know, whether marketing training has to be has to be increased. Absolutely. People need to know branding, pricing, distribution, all the things. But it's the entry ticket. The company, 25%. Finally, someone we can blame. If your boss is the dick, it's really hard to be successful. But far and away, the largest factor for success of marketers are change leadership skills. The best people we had in the study, they were just, weren't just good marketers. They knew how to have an idea and actually make it happen. And that's the trick. Great marketing leaders are great change leaders. That's the thing. But there's something that stands in the way of a lot of marketers' ability to be a change leader, and it's the job description. And give you some examples. Recently, the life of millions of consumers in the world has changed, right? Everything has changed. You know, homeschooling, home cooking, you know, all the stuff. Oh my God, you know? And marketers in many firms had nothing better to do than spend money on and these we'll things. Together. 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 And there's even sound together. sometimes. Together. Right? Together. Um, together. You know, thank together. you, campaigns. Together. We get through this together. together. We are, together. We are, we are together. in this together, right? Together. 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 What the? Together. No, you're not in this together with your customers. You know, they have much harder lives sometimes. But people did this because their job description said, do advertising. That's why. It's a bit like the people who created this menu card, who went all the way to design it, to print it, to laminate it, only to show us what's no longer available. <laughs> because their job description didn't say, be useful. You know. the Whitney Zoom, how we call it, right? <laughs> it's not the right thing to do, but I'll do it anyway because I have a budget, right? Don't get into the Whitney Zoom. Don't do that. And it's all because of Morris Wittles. It's his fault. Because in the 1920s, Morris Wittles observed the clerks at a railway company every evening. This is the Bank of England, it's not a railway company, but it must have looked similar. And he was counting the jobs they were doing, and they were, you know, looking how, he, how they handled the cash and where they put all the money and how they opened the envelopes and did and this. And he counted 19 different jobs that the financial, the clerks were doing. And he wrote them down in what he called the job specification. And that was revolutionary, because now the company could hire and train and reward all the clerks exactly in the same way again and again and again and again. That's how it was born. Now, the job description is great under one condition. What your customers want doesn't change. On another day, the job description would have been the perfect tool. Unfortunately, today is not another day. The problem is the job description are standing in the way of what people should do. And my question to you is this. What's your real job? Is your job to execute your campaigns and spend your marketing budgets and 
you know, everything you've done, like in the last couple of years, just do more of it and try to fight for some money? Or is your job to step back and think about how you can help the company achieve the hardest nut it currently has to crack, which is growth? And be ready to take the pushback, to take all the anger you get from colleagues if you're getting into their departments, you know, and, and deal with all of this because you want to actually help and you want to figure out what your real job is. And if you want to do your real job and not follow your job descriptions, then I have tips for you. Let's go to tips. Tip number one, tackle big issues. If you want any influence as a marketer, as an agency leader, as a leader of change, as an expert, make sure the issues you tackle are big. This is the PlayStation. This is Sony's most important product. It has saved the Sony company many times as the world's best-selling gaming console. But what many people don't know is that Sony had almost missed that market. Because when gaming became a thing and Nintendo started to come out with these, everybody in Sony was against gaming. Because it didn't fit with the values and it's not what the company did. You know, at the time they did like TVs and VCRs and these things. Betamax, you remember. Except one guy, and his name is Ken Kutaragi. And Ken, in an almost 10-year-long battle, convinced the Sony management of two things. First, there is a customer need for gaming. Gaming is a customer need. People want this. He showed pictures. He showed examples. I'm sure they must, must have taken, like, you know, films at the time, you know, when this was happening. And he convinced the management people really, really want gaming. But he also convinced the management of something else, that gaming is a company need. We can make it, it's going to make money, and it's compatible with our values. And he was working in what we call the value creation zone. That is the zone where you, as a marketer, as an agency leader, as an expert, as a technology expert, that's where you have power. That's the only place where you have power. So the question is, what is your value creation zone in your company, and how can you make it larger? Okay. Tip number two, punch above your weight. When your competitors, because of a crisis, are cutting their budget, are leaving markets, are shrinking their activities, this is the moment when especially smaller players can actually punch above their weight and do something they couldn't do normally. A great example, you know, Emirates, one of the world's largest airlines, once announced that they will only start flying in July 2020. And Qatar Airways, you know, the small player in the room, said, we're going to jump in there, right? Punching above their weight. By the way, do you consider flying the next couple of, couple of days or weeks? Yeah? Do you want to see the new Qatar Airways uniform? I got a picture for you. You will actually will absolutely love it. it is, it's, not, it's no fake. So welcome to business class. <laughs> Punch above your weight, very important. Flipping the switch is my next tip. Flip the switch. Okay, let me tell you about history. I started out in feminine hygiene marketing. That was my first job. And I was in a big battle between the tampon and the napkin. That was our market. I was the tampon guy, and I had to convince the napkin users to switch. That was my job, right? my first marketing job. Now, it was hard because my customers were used to their products. They didn't want to change. They didn't want to change. It was so hard. But there was a moment when we had a chance. And this is when something in the life of our female customer radically changed. Birth. This was the moment when everything got different, when all of a sudden people were very open. So my job was, in this moment, to give trials for our product. Great new opportunity. Life is changing. Um, here's a trial. We are running currently the world's largest trial programs on so many things. Homeschooling, homeworking, video conferencing, new ways of doing this, new ways of doing that, new ways of doing conferences. A lot of things. And a few of those things will stick because people start to actually like them. The question is, what could your customers try right now? Life is changing. It's a great opportunity for marketers to come in and have people try something new, try something they didn't want to try before. So, 
What would your customers try now? The question. Find new growth. People will absolutely value when you go out and start to rethink the business. Even if you just started out as a trainee, even if, you are, if you're a supplier, even if you are um, someone as an expert, and help the company find completely new ways of making money. Moscow food delivery firm, restaurants closed, they didn't have anything to ship, so they started cooking themselves using the recipes of the restaurants, shipping it to customers, finding new sources of growth. Chinese movie firm, cinemas close, what did they do? They launch it on social media with a social media company in China. Big success. They're thinking of doing it again in the future because it's actually, it was amazing, finding new sources of growth. Dorint hotels, they're renting out empty hotel rooms as day offices because people are sick and tired with their dogs and their kids crawling over them when they do video conferences in, in the kitchen. Guess what they think you have on your desk? Stamps, obviously. <laughs> right? So, finding new sources of growth. The question is, where could you find new growth of source for your company? Think big. Side with the revenue camp. I love this one. And Jakub alluded to it earlier on. Hugely important. If you want influence, as a marketer, as a technology expert, as a social media specialist, whatever your job is, make sure people understand how you're driving the business. This is a chart a friend of mine has given me um, some years ago. He, he really regretted that because I've shown it at hundreds of conferences. And he presented the marketing projects to the board, and they were obviously a segmentation review, adding the millennial dimension, scaling up programmatic across all platforms. And I cited the CEO who said, whatever the fuck that means, scaling up programmatic across all the problem is, when people outside marketing are seeing charts presented by marketers like this, these people are losing their will to live. Because why would they care? This is internal stuff. It's, they don't care. Seriously. What's on the mind of a typical CEO or managing director or whoever, right? the average managing director next door? What do they care about? Well, the ones that I know, they care a lot about revenue and they care about cost and then a strategy and organization. What if you're the marketer? What, if you, what are you if you're not revenue? You're automatically cost. It's very simple, right? You don't have a choice. It's not like in between. You are the revenue, and if you're not, then sorry, you are cost. And what do smart people do with cost? Reduce it. If anybody is cutting a marketer's budget, any time, it can only be one reason. The person believes that budget will not help the revenue. It's really simple. Because why on earth would you then cut it? It would be stupid, right? You wouldn't cut it. So it's very simple. I mean, if budget cut for you is just nothing than a warning sign that someone says, I don't believe this is working. OK, good, thank you. Let, first of all, let me know. Let me try harder. So what can you do? Of course, do your numbers. I mean, we talked about this a lot, and the whole group this morning talked about it. Now, you know, we can talk about it forever. One idea is do not try to prove your numbers to finance. Team up with the devil. Get them on board. <laughs> They're pretty good at doing numbers. So why not have them do it? I mean, or at least help. It's a very powerful thing, right? So one way if you could do it. And then there are many ways of proving your numbers from your know, big data kind of like um, modeling to very simply asking what would we have to believe for this amount of one million krona to be worth it, right? I mean, you could just flip the question. So many ways of doing it. That's not what we're focusing on here. But you got to do your numbers. Every marketer in the world has to explain what their budget is there for and then do the numbers. The second one is language is quite important. You know, I, my suggestion would be to skip words like segmentation and millennials and attribution and so on, but rather use the very simple terms. And I'll tell you what, revenue, Customers and profit always work in every C-suite in the world. It's very simple language. Just look at your audience and switch the words you're using. Really simple for you. So how could you decide with the revenue camp? Are you still good for a few more? I have a few more. Not many, but I have a few more. Okay. Ah, let's talk about your colleagues. The people in the other departments. 
The thing is that they all can say no, they all can turn you down, they all can say, no, we don't want to do it. But sometimes we ignore that because we believe the idea we have is so amazing that we just walk into the salon next door and say, hey, you know, we're going to do this wonderful new project, we're going to change the budgets and we're going to change the way we want to work with you, we have installed a new software which you will absolutely love. And the moment you leave the room, a lot of your colleagues will hope you'll just get sucked into a big black hole because they don't care, it's not their agenda, right? So we have to accept that you are in the business of change and change is a context sport, so you got to walk the halls. You got to walk the halls. You got to figure out, you know, what's going on in all the other departments. And that's not just true if you're working in a company. If you're a consultant or if you're selling technology, it's exactly the same thing. You got to run around in the client's company to understand what's actually going on and what all these other people think about your wonderful tool. Because if they are against it, maybe that your guy or your girl has no chance whatsoever to get it through. So be part of this. And uh, this is Ed Smith. He's not a former Abercrombie model, as the shirt would suggest, but he's a very successful chief marketing officer currently at Amazon. And he had achieved the unthinkable. He installed a paywall, a paywall, in front of Australia's largest business magazine. It's creatively called The Australian. And that was really difficult. Just imagine, right? What do journalists say if you want a paywall? I say, get lost, right? We don't want a paywall. You know, we want our things to be read. But he did the paywall. And he did it in a really smart way. He went out, he knew it was hard, he met everybody, and then he shut up and listened, which is really hard, right? And listened to all the concerns, and he took notes. He didn't promise anything, he just told people. And then they went back to the headquarters and made a decision. The paywall that they started doing changed, very different from the ones they had in mind but he took all the ideas on board. But then he did the most important thing. You must never forget when you do a change project, don't open the champagne bottles now, but go back to everybody and tell them what you've done. And tell them, here's what we've done, here's what you told me, here's what we have taken on board, here's what we could not take on board. You will not make everybody happy, but you will earn the most important thing you can earn as a change leader, and that is respect. How could you walk the halts, hit the head and the heart. You cannot prove anything to your colleagues, nothing, if they're not listening. But you can tell them a story, a story that gets under the skin, a story that captures their hearts and their minds, hugely important. Napoleon once said, a leader is a dealer in hope. And when you're running change projects, then people are looking at you as a source of hope. They want hope from you. They don't want panic, they want hope. And that's why for your work, every marketer in the world needs to have a story that is so capturing that when you enter the elevator in the morning in the office and you meet some people, without thinking, you can just tell your story very quick and do it in a way that's very consistent. This is Jim Farley, he is the CMO of Ford. He took over when Ford, a couple of years ago, was almost bankrupt, no marketing span, nobody wanted to do anything with marketing, really difficult times. He got a big budget for his marketing plans. And he got it, of course he did a lot of things, but he also had an amazing story. And the story he told everybody in the boardroom, in the shop floor, everywhere, was this. The blue Ford Oval, for my parents, was a symbol of pride. If I look in the New York Times now, I don't see pride, I see bankruptcy. <laughs> we need to bring the pride back to our people, to our customers, and then they will come back and buy our cars. Hugely powerful. Ed Smith, I talked about him just a minute ago. Ed Smith didn't say, oh, we need a paywall and here's the data. No, he didn't say that. Well, he said that eventually, but he said, he started out by saying, I'm here to help save quality journalism. That is a powerful story. That made people sit up. So the question is, what's your story of hope? Okay, let me come to the final point. And it's the most important point. If you want to be a change leader, you have to become your own influencer. The internet is great. Because if you know something and you want to write a blog that 100,000 people read, you can. If you know something and you want to do a podcast that 100,000 people listen to, you can. It's easy. But the internet is also great for people who do not know a lot. 
but who are really good with the camera. And they're calling themselves influencers. And I don't mean all influencers, I mean the ones that aren't that good. And when you look at what they're posting, when you look at what they're writing, a lot of the things that you see, to my mind, should go straight into a bin. That's why I call them binfluencers. And I want to give you some examples of binfluencer things that I've heard. Okay? It's all about, everything is about a great customer experience. Okay, why then are every day literally thousands and hundreds of people queuing up to get humiliated by crews of Ryanair and Wizard and what they're called just to save some money? It's not that simple. Right? It, it, if, if, if price is part of the experience, uh, maybe that, that too is right. But we can't just say that, right? It's all about experience. Or how about this? Um, I love this one. Um, um, brand ad advocacy. Brand advocacy is the new currency in marketing. Okay, what are the fastest growing retail chains around the world? It's discounters like Aldi and Lidl. Because a lot of people just want to have a big, good deal. And you know what? To get them to do brand advocacy for some of those low-cost retail brands, you'd have to pay them a lot of money. And some people would rather hide their shopping bag. Right? No, yes, brand advocacy may be the right thing and maybe the wrong thing. You can't just say that. Or how about this? Someone wrote this recently. Modern marketing is all about getting your customers to spend more time with your brand. Hmm, interesting. Do you know the Dollar Shave Club? Did you read that example, right? They basically send you the shavers home. The whole premise, <laughs> biggest success in marketing in many years, the, the whole premise of the Dollar Shave Club was you can now spend less time with your brand. Isn't that nice? So you just can't say it. It's not that simple, right? The problem is if you simply follow what some influencer just warbles into a camera, you know, in a New York cap, um, is, isn't, isn't helping you. I want you to unfollow the influencers because if you pass the chatter on without checking, you become a chatbot. And you know what? Chatbots are very easy to replace because one day your company just looks for a better chatbot. Easy. No, that's not how you work it. You gotta find your own truths as a real influence, as a real change, you've got to find your own truth. Why are customers buying? Why are they coming back? Why are they buying more? Why are they buying less? My list is not your list. My list is not complete. You have to find your own list and your own answers to what actually really matters. And once you do, you start spreading the word. And that will make you a real influencer. This is the second attempt. The East Germans made a break in. We could be there. Fourth point of the race here. Viel Glück und viel Segen. Front by home is on. Can they outsprint each other? Which one is the faster? If you want to run and people hold you up, knowing how to run is not good.
good enough. You've got to find ways to remove the barriers. If you want to lead change in your company in very difficult times, if you want to help your company lead through the very difficult phase we're currently in, if you want to become the driver of growth at the moment, if you want to make this your moment, knowing marketing is not good enough. You've got to find a way to break the barriers and make change happen. And if you think about it, in this room, there are the smartest and most talented marketers in the entire country. And your collective power is so big that you could absolutely change the course of companies in a very big way. But there is a condition. You have to be ready to take your job description, to tear it apart, and to do what's right. All you ever wanted is on the other side of fear. And I hope to see you on that other side. Thank you very much.